great. Praise the Lord. Right. Brother Kelvin, welcome aboard, my friend. You're our first speaker from Ireland, so we're glad to have you. Glad to be here. Folks, welcome, and we're going to get started. Brother Kelvin, would you like to open us up in prayer? Yes, indeed. And I, if, it, if I may, I would like to play a binding prayer. Yes, sir. Uh, Jesus said that uh, what we bind on earth has already been bound in heaven. So, Lord, I praise you this morning that you are still the same wonderful, loving act of God who created this world, who made us in your image a little lower than the angels, and that you sent Jesus your perfect sacrifice. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you came, ministered, taught, submitted to that horrible crucifixion, but were wonderfully raised to life and have poured out your Spirit upon us. So we thank you, Lord, that we come together this morning under your authority. And in your holy name, I would bind and rebuke every spirit that is contrary to the Holy Spirit that would in any way seek to interfere with any aspect of this transmission, with the minds of those who are listening to it, or indeed with Shannon and myself, we would just ask and thank you for your cover and protection and mighty power. Glory be to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, I say amen to that. Again, welcome everybody. And we're excited to have Brother Kelvin McCracken here tonight. And Brother Kelvin, the mic is yours. You can take all the time you want. If you want to break it any time, no worries. Just let me know. Fine. I want to share really, I hope, three very powerful and important messages today. And uh, I particularly would say to anyone who is a Freemason or perhaps a son or daughter of a Freemason who is listening and who dearly loves their father, please listen and do not switch off from what I say because I have, I believe, a very important and loving message to bring. First, I want to just confirm that we have a God who is holy, just, perfect in every way, and that he is also loving and compassionate beyond anything that we can understand and very patient with us as I have seen in my life secondly I'm here to say today that out of my experience and the revelations that God has given over these past years I'm aware that one of the greatest weapons that Satan is using against particularly against the Christian church and the members of the Christian church and the communities associated is the tool of Freemasonry it is I would describe it as an insidious cancer within the body of Christ subtly developed over the last 300 years by one who hates Jesus and hates the kingdom and has used every trick in the trade and every deceit to to seek to undermine kingdom building I would also want to make the point very strongly from the very beginning I was a Freemason for about 17 years I have a deep empathy with those who are in the order and a deep respect for the vast majority of those who are members of Freemasonry but they have been as I was deceived in a very subtle way into worshipping a god other than Jehovah. That's basically the the three things I want to share with you. To do that, I feel that perhaps I need to share a little bit of my own story to start with, and then we will build on looking in more detail at why I'm making these assertions, which are pretty strong. I was brought up in the church through Sunday school when I came to about the age of 16 I professed my belief and trust in Jesus something which I have never actually wavered in the years since Um, but it was an incomplete understanding of the love and power of Jesus at that time Uh, to fast forward to when I came back to Ireland after um, some study abroad 
got married in 1968 and we joined a local church. My wife and I were both very active members. We led the, the youth club. We were involved in the choir. I was elected to committee. Looking on at me from the outside, I would think you know, everyone looked on me as a pretty ordinary, average, good Christian. But in the early 70s, two colleagues at work, both churchgoers, uh, invited me to consider joining Freemasonry and assured me that it would be something that would be very compatible with my outlook and with my general uh, beliefs and that they would recommend me for membership. And so I, without knowing anything about Freemasonry, because that is one of Satan's subtle tricks, uh, I agreed to consider being considered for membership. And Julie was informed that I had been accepted and that there would be an initiation ceremony. And basically all you're told before that ceremony is that you have to assert a belief in God, which was not a problem for me, uh, and that there would be some preparation which my friend, my colleague would, would, would do, which um, he might, you know, I might think a bit odd, but not to worry about it, all would be explained later, which I innocently accepted as reality. So, we came to the initiation ceremony and uh, I was prepared as every other candidate would be with certain articles of clothing dishevelled a bit for reasons which will, will be explained later. Um, my foot slipshod and a blindfold and a halter round my neck. Those are typical of the preparation of any Freemason. But he advised me, don't worry about these things, they look a bit odd, but everything will be explained to you afterwards. So I accepted that. Now, that's part of the, the preparation of the, the candidate for entering Freemasonry. Um, so with that blindfold on, I was then accepted into the lodge room. And I was described as one in darkness wishing to approach the light. Now think about that. I was a Christian. Jesus is the light of the world. Were those words with which I should have been comfortable? Frankly, no. But in the circumstances you're in, you don't think too much about it. I was then asked to kneel to receive the benefit of prayer. So, okay, I, I felt at home with, with this situation. There didn't seem to be anything untoward. And eventually then, um, after some further preambles, I was told that I was going to be shared, there were secrets would be shared with me, and that the I needed to take a, a voluntary obligation prior to the receiving of these secrets. And I was assured that a, there was nothing contrary to my religious beliefs, be they what they may, nothing at variance with my, my feelings as a man of honour, nor the allegiance I owed to the Crown, and that everyone else present had already taken such a voluntary obligation. So at that point, I agreed. I will explain later why that was the the, the step really of falling into the trap. Um, I was then asked to kneel at an altar which I couldn't see but I was told was there and on which there was placed a volume of the sacred law and to place my hands upon it. And then I was fed a very detailed legalistic statement um, which actually makes the Ten Commandments look like child's play, a few words at a time, never having seen it. And the final part of it was the so-called ancient penalty, which was a horrible spiritual curse, in fact, when you look at it in the cold daylight. Now, think about this. I'd never been 
given the opportunity to see this or to know what I was going to say until it was all out, a few words at a time. And quite frankly, in those circumstances, you don't even know what you have said. Then, having been told it was a voluntary obligation, I was then asked to complete it by kissing the volume of sacred law, raised right hand, or anything else which would be binding on my conscience for all time. In other words, I was being asked to take an oath. So, that is the background to how one gets drawn into Freemasonry. And it is really, you could perhaps begin to see already that there was an element of cover-up and deceit in what I was being asked to say and to do. But at that point I was completely oblivious to there being anything untoward. Having taken the oath, which is, as I say, was not described as such, um, I was then asked, having been in a state of darkness, what did I most require or desire? And I would... Hang on a second. We have lost Kelvin. Let's dial him back. Brother Kelvin, welcome back. Hello. We hey. We get all cut off there. That's all right. These things sometimes happen. But we will continue. We just plead the blood of Jesus over the connection tonight. And we're live with Kelvin McCracken, live from Ireland. Kelvin, you dropped off only just about 30 seconds ago. They have had you bow down at an altar you could not see, and they begin to have you um, give an oath, and they begin to tell you about the penalties. Pick back up there. Yep. Um I, I explained after that that uh, once I'd taken that oath, um, I was then asked the question, having been in a state of darkness, what do you most desire? And the answer I had to give was light. And the blindfold was then removed. And as I did so, the worshipful master of the lodge said, and God said, let there be light, and there was light, quoting Genesis verse one, uh, one, chapter 1, verse 3. At the time, it felt comfortable. There was scripture being used, but when you think about it in cold light, it was blasphemy using Genesis 1 in that way. Um, and that is typical of all the machinations within the, the language of Freemasonry, that there's a subtle distortion and deceit all the way through, as I began to realize many years later. Are you getting the message? Absolutely, Hello? keep going. Yep, okay. Um, the Perhaps I should say at this side time that um, the I'll come back to the issue of the actual wording of that oath and the the uh, the spiritual curse that's in, invoked in that because that is one of the key elements of the whole journey of Freemasonry. Um, there are three degrees in the so-called outer lodges, the blue lodges, which are the, the ones that most Freemasons would be associated with. And they probably, in most cases, don't know very much about the fact that there are many other levels of Freemasonry above that. I don't know what the proportion is, but I would guess that at least perhaps 80% of people never go beyond those three degrees which are the Entered Apprentice, Fellow Craft, and the Master Mason degree. And then if you've been in those and go through a number of years of offices at different levels, you can end up as a Worshipful Master of the Lodge for one year. So, I confess that I didn't really have any discomfort about that first degree, other than that the as I say, all of these elements of having clothing disarrayed and so forth. When I got to the third degree, the Master Mason, there is a part of it which is the, the myth or legend of Hiram Abith, and it is the source of the curses which are invoked in the first three degrees. 
And at that stage, there was a little bell ringing somewhere in the back of my head that there's something not quite right here. But to be honest, I couldn't be clear about it. And I stopped going to the lodges for a while, but uh, to the meetings, but then the two guys who had got me into it came and said, you know, why are you not coming? And I said, well, I'm not sure that this is for me. And they said, well, you know, get, get more involved and you'll, you'll find it really interesting. So being someone who's either in something or out of it, I got more involved, and within a few years, I was the Worshipful Master of the Lodge. 1979. And that was a very significant year for me, because I knew that, although I was doing all the right things, I wasn't really in deep relationship with Jesus. And I was at a conference in Austria, and for three weeks and being the eternal optimist went out on the Sunday looking for an English speaking service found one and ended up as a sole member of the congregation so I got the full bucket full and I really felt that the Lord was speaking to me and challenging me about things, areas of my life that I was holding back from him so that evening I sat by the side of the lake and I said Father I know I've been holding out in some areas I want to open the doors I want you to come in and take over everything and that, that was it there were no big flashing lights there was no Damascus Road experience in the sense of Paul but there was something very significant happened that night in my life and the Lord began to really move over the next few years and the weird thing now to be looking back is that the Lord didn't suddenly awaken me up to the error of Freemasonry. Um, for the next three years, I was actually most involved in Freemasonry, although my life was going on very powerfully in other directions within Christian things. Next big milestone was 1985. On an evening when I was out at a lodge meeting, an installation dinner, my wife went to bed to read a book that our daughter, our nine-year-old daughter, had bought at her Sunday school book fest. A book by David Watson, who was dying of cancer, Fear No Evil. And as she read that book, the Holy Spirit came powerfully upon her. And she was filled with a sense of love and acceptance and fullness that she'd never experienced before. And that was a transforming stage in her life. And when she shared that with me, it was, it was so powerful and so clear and real to her. And the events of the next few months, just everything she touched, the Lord was in it. So we ended up going to a Welsh holiday camp, a Christian holiday camp, and had quite a, a massive experience there of the power of the Holy Spirit. And during that time, I felt led into the healing ministry. And so the Lord actually led me into the healing ministry while I was still a Freemason and used me and my first time when I prayed for someone in public, a miracle happened. There were little things within Freemasonry that were beginning to disturb me and there was one part of the ritual that I had stopped refusing, I refused to do because uh, I, I felt that it was very clearly a, a, a words were of salvation by works and not by faith and then something from the first degree began to really trouble me because in the very first degree the Bible is open at Psalm 133 how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity and then in the teaching in the first part of that degree we're told we maintain the unity because we never discuss religion or politics because they're two subjects on which men can never agree and so I began to realise that the whole basis of the unity of the Lodge was actually based on a false premise and one where I couldn't, as a Christian, share my faith and that began to really trouble me so to cut a long story short, in 1987 I felt I had really had to resign from Freemasonry 
and sent a letter and did so uh, received my received my demit certificate and effectively thought well okay that's it I've, I'm out that's it and then in 1992 the Lord's patience is amazing I met David Measures in Corfu on holiday and life changed because he was asking about the Orange Order and my reply to him was know nothing about it I never was in it um, and then I made a statement which <laughs> started a whole train of events I said I know a little bit about Freemasonry I was in it but I came out of it and David with his usual directness said to me you come out of it did it come out of you and I looked at him and said what do you mean he says you took oaths on your knees at a false altar to a false god and the curses that you took upon yourself are upon you and your wife and your family and the penny dropped with me that yes indeed that was truth so he said well we've come to your bedroom tomorrow morning my, me and my wife and we'll pray with you and we said great that's a good idea and I was thinking and Eveline my wife was thinking well perhaps ten minutes and out into the sun but two and a half hours later David had very methodically taken me round and round all the turns of the degrees in which I had been involved and I had experienced physically virtually nothing and my wife had experienced two and a half hours of feeling sick, nauseous, pain, etc. And the real sense of having been delivered from things at different stages. And so I had a real revelation of the fact that I had unwittingly brought all of this upon her that we are one flesh and therefore the curses that I had invoked unwittingly had affected her and indeed our children we have seen this time after time in ministry over the last 25 years that people right down the generations are affected so that's why I'm saying to you if you're a son or a daughter today of a Freemason look upon him as someone who has been hoodwinked into something that he would not have touched with a barge pole if he had known what he was getting into some people are look upon the Freemasons as villains they are not they are victims of a very subtle and cruel deceit and it has had widespread implications within the body of Christ over the last 300 years and I hope to explain more of that as I tell you a little bit more depth about Freemasonry. So perhaps I'll take a break here and start Shalom. You may have something to ask or perhaps someone else may want to ask me something. Well, we're excited to be here tonight with Minister Kelvin McCracken, former fourth degree Mason, carried the title of Worshipful Master, and he truly escaped Freemasonry, was set free by the power of Jesus Christ and he shed blood and he's here to tell the story today you know as I mentioned to Kelvin off air um, we've had people who have done programs on this show and others where they uh, talk about Freemasonry from a third party point of view maybe what they've read what they've studied but I have never actually had someone who was involved in Freemasonry who got out who was willing to to tell the story, much less someone involved in deliverance ministry. And that's what's so unique. Not only did Kelvin uh, escape and live to tell this story, but he is helping others get free from the bondage which is Freemasonry. And um, I'm particularly interested in this because um, I found out that um, my own family had Freemasonry on my father's side. My great-grandfather was a third-degree Master Mason in the state of Georgia. 
and uh, sadly it contributed to his premature death, unleashed a generational bloodline curse, and uh, it, it affected me. It affected my father, my brothers, my grandfather, and uh, I cried out to the Lord about 15 years ago, and I said, God, there's something wrong. What's wrong with me and my brother? And God spoke to me in a dream and said, you and your brother Damon have a generational curse you need to break. And I shared this with Kelvin, have shared it with some of you. Well, next day my brother Damon called me and said, i got a book I want you to consider reading by Derek Prince called The Blessing of the Curse You Choose. And then I told my brother about the uh, dream. And the Lord led us down a track which uh, has led me here ten years later uh, to have Brother Kelvin on the program and be able to bring him to you tonight to tell you the reality of Freemasonry, um, what's involved when you get involved into it, what effects it can have on you, and not only you, but as we've learned, um, anyone you've had sexual relations with, you have a soul tie with them, as Kelvin will explain, and you may not have been involved in Freemasonry direct, or even your parents or grandparents, but maybe your spouse has. So Kelvin, am I correct that anybody whether they've been in it or a spouse has been in it, they're going to need deliverance from these spirits of Freemasonry. Am I correct in that? Yes, this is the devilish way in which Satan works, that through something which God intended to be good, the sexual union of man and wife, uh, through sexual sin, fornication and so forth, uh, the net gets spread very wide, so one can be completely uninvolved in Freemasonry but have unfortunate sinful sexual relationships or indeed even in a marriage can marry someone whose family line has been involved in Freemasonry and therefore that opens the, the gate Satan wants, he's a legalist and he doesn't care how he gets that but he stands very firmly on his so called rights once we open the door uh, it doesn't matter how small that door is he will stand firm and use it against us and that's how he uses sexual sin in a very powerful way to attack the body of Christ so if you're tuning in tonight pay close attention to this interview with Kelvin McCracken as he continues to speak tonight and reveal more of what he found out was the truth uh, being inside the organization and whether you've been involved in it, tuning in, or someone um, in your spouse's family been involved in it, you're going to need deliverance, I'm here to tell you. The great news is Jesus set Kelvin free, and he's helping set others free. Uh, before you continue, and we'll ask you some more questions later, Kelvin, just to give us an idea, how prolific is the Freemasonry organization? Uh, is it a worldwide organization? Number two, in your experience, um, are there even quote-unquote Christian pastors and religious leaders involved in this? It is a very much a worldwide organization. Um, being in a Christian community, it was presented to me as if the, the, you know, there is one God. But then you find in the higher orders that in fact any God is acceptable. There are Jewish lodges, there are Muslim lodges, etc right across the world so uh, it is a, a syncretism in terms of the, the acceptance of any any god is acceptable basically within Freemasonry it makes this one of its big strengths that it's liberal, it's open to everyone all are brothers in, you know, in the flesh and uh, it therefore utterly denies uh the unity of the body of Christ it's very uh, very interesting, there are two main roots within Freemasonry one of them largely down to Albert Pike, an American uh, a barrister, a soldier a very brilliant mind but a very twisted mind and that is the so called Scottish Rite and there are 33 degrees in the Scottish Rite so an awful lot more stuff above the three that I was involved with um, but that is hidden territory to most people and within those 33 degrees every Christian doctrine is blasphemed or parodied if you like in some other way but 
blasphemed I would say um, there's a false communion there's a false resurrection false atonement at one point the candidate is described as being in the order of Melchizedek uh, I could go on and on but it is a very determined attack and it was actually revelation in 1997 about the demonic hierarchy within Freemasonry that really was a big breakthrough in terms of helping people to deliverance I'll come back to that later <laughs> the other route is actually to my mind even worse because it claims to be the York right so called has 13 degrees and it claims in its upper end to be holy Christian and therefore it's the one that many Christian clergy would have been drawn toward uh, in the, the two top degrees in that are the, the Knights of Malta the Order of the Knights of Malta and the Knights Templar degree is the top degree now in the opening paragraphs of the ritual of the Order of the Knights of Malta it claims that the York Rite is the only means whereby two wonderful institutions Freemasonry and Christianity become fused into one and then it la launches off into Christian language and uh, quotations and scriptures and from then on there's really a process of brainwashing that leads people into believing that Christianity and Freemasonry are totally compatible so you've got these two very, very different roots within Freemasonry and the, the oath that's taken in the Knights Templar degree is along the lines of having the head struck off and placed on a pinnacle or spire and the skull sawn asunder and the brains exposed to the scorching rays of the sun wow and that is a pretty comprehensive curse on the mind Hence. and I do believe that those who have taken that degree and taken spoken those words over themselves have effectively become brainwashed to the extent that I wrote an article a few years ago and one gentleman came back very irate because I had mentioned that Freemasonry allowed for other gods and he came back and said that the only god recognized by Freemasonry was Jesus Christ really? yep so we're, fi we're fighting a battle here with our hands tied behind our back if we don't recognize that these spiritual curses are really very powerful and have been being a, been enacted over the last well three masonry be really began with the English Lodge in 1717 so the problem is if we look at the scriptures in, in Leviticus about unwitting sin they speak of there of the sin uh, of the priest or of the, the leader of the community or of the community or of individuals and there's one very telling phrase in um, Leviticus chapter 5 if a person thoughtlessly takes an oath to do anything whether good or evil in any matter one might carelessly swear about even though he is unaware of it when he learns of it he will be guilty when anyone is guilty he must confess what he, that he has sinned and as a penalty for the sin he has committed he must bring a sin offering we don't have to bring a sin offering we have to confess, repent forgive those who have brought any curse down upon us and come into fresh authority with Christ but that that really is the key here that where people have taken unwittingly taken these oaths that they didn't even realize were going to be oaths and have sworn these things over themselves they have brought a heap of trouble upon themselves and their families Kelvin that one curse that you described which uh, involves the head could that manifest into for example insanity it could manifest in very many ways indeed um, interestingly the Irish Masons have been supporting for the last 20 years or more the Alzheimer's Disease Society 
Really? Yeah. Oh, boy. Interesting. That is interesting. Now, um, with the limited knowledge I have on Freemasonry, uh, I've heard also that one of the um, thing rituals that you do has to involve a, a noose around the neck. Um, well, what is the significance yeah, the noose, of that? The noose, is on the, the noose is on the neck of the candidate coming in in the very first degree. It is removed because there's also an, an, another aspect of the, the rituals and the teachings. And there are all of these different levels in each degree that I would take hours to go into. But yes. just to give you a couple of examples, um, the candidate is described as one without maim or defect and free born and then the, the noose is removed from around his neck at that point as a symbol that he is a free man but in fact I believe subtly that the noose around the neck is a hold that the enemy establishes over that candidate when he has bowed down at that false altar I have seen people who could not pray out loud in public they felt as if they were being choked Wow. And of course, the oath, the very first uh, degree, the words that the candidate speaks over himself is that uh, bearing in mind the ancient penalty of having the tongue torn out, the, the throat cut across and the tongue torn out, actually. Every, every curse in each degree is a curse of death. There's a physical curse of death but in that there's a curse on communication and in fact I would suggest that the five senses are all attacked in the very first degree because you have the blindfold on the eyes and I believe at the point when we take the first oath the spiritual blindfold like, comes down like the words of, of Isaiah in chapter 6 when the Lord said that hearing they would not understand and seeing they would not perceive that that would my, was my experience that I accepted all the teaching that I got in Freemasonry and then taught it as a worshipful master to other people but totally oblivious to the fact that it was completely at loggerheads with my Christian walk I was spiritually blinded until that day of deliverance that I had with David Measures and from that day on the Lord just began to reveal things to me about giving me that understanding about those words let there be light and there was light in the first degree uh, connection with the, with the blindfold um, the fact that the various vows that the candidate makes in some of these rituals for example one is related to chastity but it's a limited restriction it speaks of treating the mother or wife or sister or daughter of a free brother free mason ensuring her chastity but it doesn't limit to dealings outside of the brotherhood um, the other examples that come to mind would be the the one I've mentioned there um, mentioned earlier about the fact that in the first degree we're told that uh, we never discuss religion or politics so therefore the unity of the lodge is not a unity based on Christ, it's a unity based on a false human understanding and so it goes on, all of these different restrictions that are placed are all uh, a distortion certainly of anything to do with, with Christian doctrine Kelvin McCracken is our special guest tonight um, Kelvin I have seen um, pictures of what is known as a Masonic Bible looks like a Bible but it has the um, the symbol on it um, what is the main text used in the lodge is it like a King James Bible or do they also have Koran the Satanic Bible, other text in there. What's your experience? Any text, any text can be used depending on the jurisdiction. Obviously, in Irish craft masonry, it is a, a version of the King James Bible with a couple of extra pages. 
In the first degree, as I said, it's open at Psalm 133. It's open at a different scripture in each degree. But the most significant thing, and one of the revelations that came to me after my experience with David, and of course, when if you're blindfolded on, when you're actually taking these, this first oath, you don't realize this, but on top of the Bible, the open Bible, are the symbols of the square and compasses. Yes. Placed on top of the Bible. And at one point in the teaching after the candidate has taken the oath, he is told that these three are the three great symbols of Freemasonry. So you have two carved man-made objects being... Things are being revealed on this program that have never been revealed here before. I know the enemy is not happy. That's all right. He can hop it. Kelvin, welcome back. Hello, I'm back again. We are live with Kelvin McCracken. So, Kelvin, pick back up. You were just mentioning uh, there's a key symbol you see associated with Freemasonry. Um, what is what is the significance of the compass in the square? Well, the, 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 the significance, so-called, of this of the compass within Freemasonry is that in circles, it's a sign of morality. It's it's encircling our works within um, limits, and certainly the square is also used to describe making you know, squaring our work and doing it well. But the key, really, subtly, is that these are placed on top of the Bible and given an equal status with the Bible. The second commandment: Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any image, anything that is, you know. So we have here a very subtle breaking of the second commandment with the the square and the compasses, placing them on the on a par with God's word. Two man-made images. That's idolatry. Kelvin, what are the main draws for people to? Um enter Freemasonry what's the motivation and what are the entry requirements can anybody join do you have to be tapped explain that for people new to Freemasonry it is claimed that the person has to apply that he will not be uh, encouraged to join but in fact in practice I would say almost everyone who has ever joined has been approached and encouraged partly by flattery that they're a good person of high moral standards and uh, charitable outlook partly by a carrot that perhaps it mightn't do them any harm in their career Um, and so uh, you have this subtle encouragement uh, oh yes and and it used to be much more important but the, the third would be uh, that if anything happens to you, you, your wife and family will be provided for by the, the Masons. Um, so there's a bit of a carrot and a bit of flattery and uh, a lack of sh- of sharing of anything about the truth about how what Freemasonry is and how it operates. Um, in fact, it's the one way that Satan uses to get people into it because if anyone really knew what I now know they would run a mile from it but at the point and actually interesting there are three loaded questions which one has asked um, during the the introduction and the very the first of those is do you come here of your own free will uninfluenced by undue solicitations of your friends and unbiased by mercenary or other unworthy motives you can see that it's maybe not quite the right thing to say yes to that question even more so the second question are you solely influenced by an un- a preconceived idea of the excellence of our order and by a genuine intention to improve your state of knowledge and to make yourself more useful to your fellow man well you know nothing about Freemasonry so how can you have a preconceived idea of its excellence and then the final bit really scary will you have permitted persist in this ceremony of initiation and in doing so become bound to us 
as we are to one another. So people say yes to those three questions and at a point when they know absolutely nothing and it is taking on trust that the two people who invited you into the lodge are decent guys and that you trust their, their judgment but they have been already deceived in exactly the same way as you are then being deceived by this subtle use of distortion and deception and these spoken words that you agree to have power don't they in the spirit uh, we actually are agreeing to becoming yoked with others and in yep. terms of um, the curses that are pronounced um, many of those actually have manifested on people um, you mentioned some of the parts of the body are there any curses that are spoken over for example the heart the liver the colon anything like that the curse in the second degree is having the heart torn thence which is pretty lethal oh yeah uh, the, the, the curse in the third degree is having the body sawn in twain and the bowels removed uh oh which is also pretty lethal oh yeah and potentially um, you know the, the, virtually as you go up through the, the various degrees every part of the mind and body is cursed in some way or another um, if you think about it in the first in each degree there's a salute the salute in the first degree is drawing the thumb across the throat which symbolizes the curse of having the throat cut across um, there are handshakes and grips and each one of these effectively becomes another area for a foothold of the enemy on, on the person the list is, is, is endless really but the, the significant thing to me which again it took a long time before I realised that and it was after the experience in 1997 um, when we let me say when you join a church and sign up to be a member of the church you place yourself under the spiritual authority of that body agreed? yes sir well when the poor Freemason in the first degree the candidate sits kneels at that altar and speaks that first oath he is effectively signing up to membership of the spiritual entity which is over Freemasonry but which he doesn't even know exists in other words he's putting himself under the spiritual authority of the whole demonic structure of Freemasonry irregardless of how many degrees they may climb they have already by joining at the low, lowest level put themselves under the authority of the top level demons and principalities right? absolutely Amazing. And the revelation, the revelation that I got in 1997 was being by being drawn into a situation with a young couple on fire for the Lord, um, really passionate to be clear and free to, to do the work that He had set for them, but had discovered that each of them had a grandfather high up in Freemasonry, and so they had prayer with a a minister who was actually pretty experienced in deliverance but didn't know much about Freemasonry and strangely the wife appeared to have been set free with that very simple prayer the husband wasn't and after multiple prayers over six years I was drawn into the discussion and into the prayer time with him now I at that stage had only been using the, the material that David had given me relating to the three, the lower three degrees because that's all I'd been in but went along to pray with this guy and on that night we saw multiple physical manifestations and a real battle and it looked as if we were having a powerful experience of deliverance and then when we got to the, the third degree and the bit that is around the false resurrection everything went quiet so we thought thank you Lord we've got this sorted now he's free 
so we went home two weeks later he phoned up and said I've had another attack I'm still not free and I said okay I realise that from what you say your grandfather was high up perhaps there's other stuff here that we don't haven't looked into and I had some stuff relating to the Knights Templar degree from David which I had up to that point never thought about so yes. I said let's let's come back and trust the Lord that we don't know what we're doing here but we'll trust the Lord for the outcome so we prayed with him that night and again there was a really powerful battle and a lot of physical manifestations and apparent deliverance again when we got into the, the realm of the Knights Templar degree uh, suddenly again everything went quiet so we thought oh Lord thank you surely we have now got this is it sorted we were having a cup of tea and the minister got a word of knowledge and he walked over and he pointed and he said in Jesus name I take authority over the 32nd degree in Freemasonry and the guy nearly jumped out of his seat and went no 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 wow great surprise and consternation of all of us and the minister then tried to get him to say I renounce Satan and all his works and he couldn't say it and we realised that we were up against something bigger than what we had understood by the Lord's guidance within about two weeks of that experience I was led to a visit uh, where another gentleman was doing some teaching and he had had the experience of a 32nd degree mason who had resigned coming to him for prayer and he was panicking a bit because he didn't know how he was going to deal with that but on the night that well they, first of all the man had a dream about a big fish and then on the night when they came together uh, Ken had a team of women who prayed in the background when he was praying with people and one of them was a very prophetic lady and she was led to uh, I think it's Ezekiel 29 the prophecy against Pharaoh and it describes in there as a big fish swimming in the river Nile but I'd put a hook in your nose and pull you out with all the little fish sticking to your scales and that was a prophecy of sovereign deliverance and when this man repented of his involvement in the 32nd degree and all that had gone before that he experienced sovereign deliverance but he also shared some of the stuff that was in the 32nd degree and in the 32nd degree Ahura Mazda is described as a true source of light so he is the God who is being revealed in the 32nd degree now Ahura Mazda is the prince of Persia the son of Zorvan the God of Persia and if you know your book of Daniel you will know that the prince of Persia we're dealing with a mighty large and powerful principality which is clearly over Freemasonry amazing I've never also, heard anyone mention that, that. Hey, keep going sorry also just to complete also in that same degree the Hindu trinity of Brahman, Vishnu and Siva is invoked so you have a direct attack on the lordship of Christ as the light of the world and on the trinity as part of the 32nd degree and that was what we were coming up against so that was a real revelation from the Lord as to the demonic hierarchy that we were up against this principality and out of that the Lord graciously downloaded a prayer through me I didn't construct it I didn't devise it I didn't think about it simply one evening I was sitting meditating and I just felt I was getting these words and I wrote them down and that prayer has been the basis for our deliverance program for the last well 23 years now and has been powerfully used and we hardly ever see a manifestation now when people pray whereas before we, th we were seeing what we thought was deliverance but in actual fact it was the higher powers playing games with us letting us see things but we were not actually seeing a full deliverance that's my Kelvin, opinion the um deliverance prayer that the Lord gave you will yep. that help anyone 
irregardless of what degree they were in, whether it be Scottish Rite, York Rite? Do you think it's an all-encompassing prayer? It covers, that can help yes, it covers Freemasonry, buffaloes, various other occultic activities, including... Uh, I, I don't know how completely... Because witchcraft is a whole area, witchcraft and Satanism is a whole area onto its own. But um, it, it it really the prayer deals with occult activity right across the board. And as long as we deal with uh, in a in an effective way the sexual sin issue, so that we're covering broad broadly the generational lines which could be implicated. It's a very complete dealing with that whole occult area. Okay, if you're just joining us, we're live with Kelvin McCracken. He was a fourth degree worshipful master mason. Got out. He's here to speak the truth and see people set free. Some questions for you before we continue. Um, I had no idea until I met you who the hierarchy was. And God's shown you it's a Hura Mazda would you say that's the top level demon under Satan, or Hura Mazda, the Prince of Persia, in Freemasonry? It would seem so. Well, Lucifer is also invoked at high level um, in some of the degrees. Okay. Um, and in one, Lucifer is described as light and Jesus as darkness. Wow. Um, so I, I wouldn't claim to have total knowledge of the levels of powers we're operating with but certainly since using this prayer and invoking the name of Ahura Mazda as I say we have really seen a, a, a real step change in how people are delivered and set free now this Ahura Mazda battle. aka Prince of Persia that's the one that Michael the Archangel was dispatched to exactly. battle with that was hindering Daniel's prayer. Folks, this is a very ancient uh, fallen angel principality. Um, I've also heard the term Jabulon. Is that another demon? Yeah, that actually, you've kept calling me the fourth degree, but really the, the, the worshipful master is not a degree. Uh, the three degrees in the blue, the, the master mason the next degree up, the fourth degree, is where Jabulon appears. Okay. And that is a, a syncretism of Jehovah, Baal, and On or Osiris, the, the Egyptian god. So that is a, a drawing together of uh, putting the name of Jehovah alongside these other false gods. So that is one of the... But he appears in the fourth degree, so... Add him on the hidden list. He's, he's in there, but... Um, not one of the maybe well I don't know how big a major player he is but certainly uh, that's where that Jabulon appears ok what about the name Baphomet is there any significance to that yep Baphomet appears as well at some levels within Freemasonry in the, but certainly in the Scottish Rite and that is another of these um, well the bestial aspects associated with Bath Baphomet Tammuz is mentioned in Ezekiel uh, is invoked at some point and um, Abaddon the keeper of the pit yes sir um, so there's a wide spectrum of uh, got false gods and false spirits invoked at different levels um, the I suspect that probably there are Buddhist influences as well, but I, I can't pin those down. But it just seems as if, uh, well, right across this, the board, every religion is potentially involved with Freemasonry at some point. Well, you mentioned, of course, the uh, the Persian um, Ahura Mazda. Uh, then, of course, yeah. Hinduism dovetails in there under him, right? Uh, Shiva, Vishnu, and what was the other one? Brahman and Shiva, yeah. Brahman. Yep. Those are definitely recognizable names in Hinduism. Um, yeah. Let me take you back to something more fundamental question, and that is um, one of the things associated, I see, with Freemasonry is a building, also known as a lodge. Um, you'll see them in many cities. 
and um, what is the significance of this lodge? What is to be found when you pass through those doors? Um, second part of the question is, once you come into the, to the uh, Freemasonry Lodge and you accept and go through the um, initiations, what goes on after that inside the four walls of the lodge going forward? Um, you just hang out over there and have a coffee? Uh, is there ongoing training? Are there ceremonies and rituals? Sexual orgies going on? You know, anything. Um, people might think, who knows? What's actually the truth? What's going on in there? Well, just the, the rituals of the various degrees, uh, new candidates being raised from the entered apprentice to the fellow craft to the master mason. Uh, if you're in the blue lodges, obviously if you're in the higher lodges, the so-called red lodges, then raising people to higher degrees, that's a major part of the ongoing work in the lodges. Uh, interestingly, in, in Australia and some other places, they're called Masonic temples which I believe is a very accurate description of them because one of the greatest deceits which is perpetrated again in the very first degree is the claim that Freemasonry is not a religion now think about it first you're required to, to have a belief in a supreme being it accepts there is an afterlife it uses scriptures, prayers, and hymns. Uh, the only bit of a hymn that I can remember now is Hail Masonry Divine. Um, there are Masonic temples. There is the altar on which the Bible is open. There's a chaplain. There are Masonic prayers. Um, the volume of the sacred law. Oaths are taken in the presence of the Most High God. It teaches salvation by works. And then there are parodies of baptism, atonement, resurrection, ascension, priesthood and communion. Would you say that is not a religion? Sounds like a religion to me. Absolutely. <laughs> well, the poor old Freemason in the very first degree is told that it is not a religion. And if you talk to any Freemason, he will assert with total confidence that it is not a religion because he's been told that. That is the sort of deception that works all the way through the whole gamut of the Freemasonry. Just to name some of the deceptions, there's questions that are put to the candidate at the initiation, which I mentioned earlier. There's the term, using used the term voluntary obligation, when in fact it's an oath. There's this claim that Freemasonry is not a religion. And of course there's the, the hiddenness. Uh, when I thought of God in the Lodge, I was thinking of Jehovah, but not realising that any God is accepted. And then there are all of these misuse of scripture and the attacks on Christian doctrine all the way through the higher degrees and that final distortion in the Knights Templar of claiming that Freemasonry is totally Christian so interestingly if you talk to any Freemason he will assert that it's not a religion but if you look into the writings for example of Albert Pike in Morals and Dogma there's about 1100 pages of it online if you really feel like a, a boring week's reading uh, but one of his claims in that is every Masonic Lodge is a temple of religion and its teachings are instruction in religion this is a true religion revealed to the ancient patriarchs and for example another one from JSM Ward I consider Freemasonry as a sufficiently organized school of mysteries to be entitled to be called a religion Freemasonry taught that each man can by himself work out his own conception of God and thereby salvation. So do you see the, the lies, the deception that are behind Freemasonry? Absolutely. We're live with Kelvin McCracken. 
Kelvin, um, I've seen some of the regalia, such as the apron. What is the significance of the apron that you see people wear? Well, the apron is a symbolic of uh, the growth. The, the initial apron that's given in the first degree is a, it's a plain lambskin, a side of purity and of what, wishing to learn. And then each stage, the uh, the apron it becomes more uh, embroidered and so forth, uh, indicating the, the stages of growth. It's also covering the uh, reproductive area and suggestions have been made that again there is a an association uh, between the the apron and um, sexual activity but I've never really thought too much about that aspect of it but certainly the apron is a, a symbol of the, the level of which the, the, the mason is in the in the lodge Speaking of the apron and reproductive system, are there any curses that relate to the reproductive system that might um, manifest in um, a wife of a Freemason unable to conceive children? I can't put my finger on the, because there are so many levels, I can't put my finger on where that becomes apparent. But I, what I can testify to is that we have at least 10 verified occasions now where an infertile couple after prayer in relation to Freemasonry were able to have a normal conception. About three years ago now, well, near four perhaps, um, one particularly strong example, a couple who the girl was told that there was no point in her considering going any further with fertility treatment because her ovaries were dead she had no eggs and she should go and adopt now she had already had prayer with us at that point um, they started a process of looking into adoption and a few months later they were on the point of paying out quite a large sum of money to adopt a child from overseas and that same week she discovered that she was pregnant and young Zach had his third birthday there about a month, two months ago and is doing very well, thank you so she, I mean as far as the doctors were concerned she was completely infertile as she says she was like Sarah and she has a healthy little boy so I do believe that, that, that fertility is, is one aspect there are a lot of curses of course on the death curses all the way through and death of firstborn and so forth those are all aspects that appear to be quite well documented Kelvin at what point are these curses uh, unleashed is it if you reveal any of the secrets of Freemasonry you leave the organization what would cause the curse to activate on a person I think if, if I <laughs> if I read the words of the the first degree to you, uh, you will perhaps begin to understand that it, it it would be physically it would be virtually impossible for anyone not to break the oath they had taken. Um, this is just I'll not read the whole thing; it's quite long. I, so and so, of my own free will and accord, in the presence of the Most High God, the great architect of the universe, and of this worthy, worshipful, and warranted lodge of ancient, free, and accepted basins, solemnly and sincerely promise by and declare that I will ever heal, conceal, and never will reveal unlawfully aught of the hidden points, secrets, or mysteries of or belonging to ancient craft masonry. I will not communicate, divulge, or discover those secrets to anyone in the whole world safe to him or them to whom they shall surely justly and of right belong I will not, listen to this bit I will not write, print or in any way delineate those secrets on anything movable or immovable beneath the whole canopy of heaven whereby any letter, symbol or the least trace thereof may become unlawfully known, legible or intelligible to myself or anyone else now 
there are not too many men around who could remember all the details of the ritual so inevitably they're written down and photocopied and passed around and therefore they are inevitably breaking that solemn vow that has been, I just read out to you and then all of these solemn I, bearing in mind the ancient penalty of having the throat cut across and the tongue torn out and buried in the rough sands of the sea and the real penalty of being deservedly branded as a wretch base, faithless and unworthy to be received among men of honour should I at any time knowingly or willfully violate in letter or in spirit ought of this my most solemn sincere and voluntary obligation as an entered apprentice mason amazing um, we're live with that's Kelvin a pretty, pretty legalistic statement yes sir as I say it would be easier to keep the ten commandments than to obey that Kelvin um, for initiates and once you're in the lodge accepted um are there books and training materials that are kept secret in the lodge that uh, they will have people read? Is there like a library open only to the Freemasons? Is there a, a specific textbook they give people to learn about the order? There is not really to my knowledge, um, but what you do have, you have the, the constitutions of the order um, it is people talk talk about it being a secret society masons will say it's a society possessing secrets and there's a degree of truth to that because the meeting places are published the constitutions are published and so forth and in fact they are legally accepted by the charities commission as charities oh though interestingly i understand that a few years ago um new zealand decided that the charity was all being inward looking and was not therefore public in the right sense and they have withdrawn charitable status from Freemasons there that's but, interesting um, the, what was the point I was about to make before that <laughs> so in terms of documentation for training yeah, materials the main thing is that if you're going to proceed to be part of, of teaching or of being involved in, in delivering a degree to someone else then you have to be uh, taught the exact, very exact wording and actions and so forth of the that particular degree, which is quite lengthy. And that's why I say it's written down because it would be very miraculous for anyone to be able to learn it all off, you know, by without writing it down. Now, do they require you to memorize this and repeat this? Absolutely, in the absolutely. It has to be memorized, word perfect, action perfect, and there's a real curse of perfectionism associated with the whole legalistic aspect of this. The positioning of the feet and the, ha the arms, this salutes everything. Specific uh, gestures. Rigid. Okay, that makes sense. Um, Kelvin, here's a question I've been wanting to ask for a while. Uh, we've, we've learned that the Scottish Rite has 33 degrees, York Rite 13, and then there's the offshoots of the York Rite, Knights of Malta, Knights of Templar. Um, are there any higher degree levels than a 33rd degree? I've heard some rumors there may be even a 100th degree or a 360 degree. Is that true or a myth? I, I couldn't comment on that. Um, there certainly is a level which is claimed to be only for those who are through the 33rd degree um, but that's not an area that I have ever really studied or investigated what about the Shriners, how do they fit into this? Ah, I'm glad you reminded me about that uh, Shriners seem to be only active in the USA maybe in Canada, I don't know um, you have to be a Master Mason to become a Shriner now it's suggested that the Shriners although you have to be a Master Mason that the Shriners are a different grouping uh, I don't know anything of the detail of the degrees or rituals of the Shriners the one bit of information that I have been given which scares me a little bit is that they acknowledge Allah as God yes. 
You notice they have the, uh, I think it's called the fez, that hat they wear that's got the crescent moon of Allah. Mm, so there, figure. there appears to be a definite tie to Islam. So you got Hinduism, uh, Hura Mazda from Persia. Um, while you were in, would it be fair to call this, do they call this the craft Freemasonry? Yeah. While you were in the yeah. craft of the lodge, did you ever come across any people that you uh, found out that were witches or Satanists also? No. And in fairness, I would suggest that even those who were in the very high levels within the lodges, within the provincial lodges, the ones that I had any contact with were all honourable men of integrity. Um, They were unaware that they were in something which was not acceptable not um, you know that they they were not in themselves actively in the in the mode of Albert Pike that I read out from there they were not seeking to deceive they were simply carrying on the tradition that they had been brought into and doing their best as as I was when I was in it so this is a spiritual blindness that is so deep seated I believe that I, I probably am relatively rare I know there are others who have come out of Freemasonry uh, one of my friends was sitting in the lodge room one night about to be promoted to a higher degree when he really felt the Lord speaking to him and saying I don't want you in this and he, he put his hand up and said sorry I don't want to continue and then subsequently, a couple of months later, he resigned completely from the order. Praise God for but that. That's, pretty, that's very rare. Um, the pe- what I encourage people to do is to pray the opposite, you know, the wording of, of the Isaiah, but the words that continue later in Isaiah is that the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. And that, that this curse that Satan has imposed within so much of the community and so much of the body of Christ will be exposed and will be brought to nothing Kelvin would it be fair to say that uh, to your point the the blindness and the deception could uh, even extend to uh, pastors in the Christian church who may actually be masons and think that it's compatible with Christianity and they truly believe that or do you think that um, they know that there's a difference. In other words, they, um, I do believe that they are blind. They're completely blind. There's been at least one um, Archbishop of Canterbury who was a Freemason. There's certainly, even at this stage, there are bishops within the Church of Ireland here in Ireland who are Freemasons. Yes, sir. The, the Church of England looked uh, had a synod about 1986 looking into Freemasonry <clears throat> but they they came to a conclusion that there were aspects of it they weren't happy with but they have never actually taken a firm stand against it and I would suggest that in a different way if, if you look at church order and, and, and spiritual structures because people don't recognize Freemasonry as being idolatry and therefore being sinful there has not been any repentance throughout the years and therefore even though we are open to come to the Lord and and receive freedom that freedom has never been received because no one has repented of their involvement And therefore I would suggest, for example, within the Presbyterian Church, it is the Kirk Session who are the spiritual authority. And where there have been generations of Freemasons who were clergy, who were elders within the Church, that legacy is still there and has not been dealt with. And we see many examples in Scripture of how God calls us to to deal with the the sins of the fathers so I would suggest that a large part of the Christian church is 
under a degree of bondage through the sins of the fathers that has not been recognized and dealt with. We're going to talk about that here in a minute. We're live with Kelvin McCracken. Kevin, uh, excuse me, Kelvin, um, there's been many photographs taken of presidents and world leaders doing handshakes and people speculating, is this a Freemason? Is that maybe one has his hand in his coat? Um, in all fairness, if you wanted to spot a Freemason, uh, are there any telltale signs that you could say, that's definitely a Freemason signal there, no question about it. How, how do you evaluate claims that maybe a particular president is a Freemason because of a hand signal? It would be difficult. Um, strictly speaking, Freemasonry hands <laughs> start again. Freemasonry handshakes are given covered. In other words, the the left hand will be covering the right hand so that it cannot be seen exactly what's happening. Now, I don't think in practice that you're going to see too many people in public places giving that type of Masonic handshake. How about where I've heard... But they might, take they might do a little bit of, of fiddling with the, the hand to identify themselves. Is there any significance of taking, let's say, one of your hands and sticking it in your, your jacket over your chest? Not aware of it, but... Okay. That, that what about code words? Um, are there code words used to identify a fellow Mason if you wanted to know? And I mean, naturally, I've seen some guys wear rings, and it would be pretty obvious if they're Mason. Well, mm. Are all Masons required to wear rings? No. Some do, some don't? Um, no, it's a, it's a choice. Um, there are, certainly, there are, there are words associated with each degree which are words that are given specifically to indicate the level at which the person is at um, and those would be required to be used in the lodge um, I suppose they could be used outside the lodge in ways which were, where people wanted to uh, indicate in a subtle way uh, that they were Mason or something like that. Well, I'll give you an example. But Here's most, a story. most people who are Masons would have a good idea about who their, you know, were Masons within their own perhaps area of work or whatever. Okay. I've heard examples of people who have um, went before a judge and they were facing a criminal charge and they would do some kind of signal to the judge to let him know that they're a Mason in hopes that the judge was and could get a lenient <coughs> uh, sentence. Does that kind of stuff happen? Uh, I, I'm sure there are examples where um, things are being done that would not be totally appropriate. And if we think of the wording, actually, um, part of the wording of one of those three degrees is um, that they will you will look after your brother's best interests and protect his back yes um, murder and treason accepted wow now that leaves a pretty wide field and sure. I'm told I can't aver I can't be a hundred percent certain on this but I'm told that in one of the higher degrees the words murder and treason accepted are then removed well I'll tell you a true story. Um, when I worked up in Northern Virginia, incidentally, I want to tell you about this. Are you are you uh, aware of ever went up to see the George Washington Masonic Memorial up in Alexandria, Virginia? It's a huge temple sitting up on a mountaintop, and apparently George Washington, first American president, was uh, associated with it. And I would drive by it every day. It was massive. Supposedly, it had an underground. In upper levels. Are you familiar with the George Washington Masonic Memorial? No, but I'm aware that a number of the early the founders of the USA were Masons, and in fact, there have been quite a number of the presidents who have Absolutely. been Masons. I've heard astronauts and so forth. Well, 
I had occasion to work along with uh, some military folk, and one of them was an African-American man. And one day I noticed he had a ring, and I looked at it, and I just straight out asked him, I said, hey, are you a Mason? He said, I am. I said, what degree? He said, I'm a 32nd degree. And I'd become friends with a man through the office, and one day we were going to a luncheon, and I rode back with him in the car back to the office, and we just had a quick conversation about it. Nobody else in the car, and I said, tell me more. And he said, well... You know, I was stationed in Germany one time, and he said it was amazing. I went over there and uh, was able to enter the lodge, and you would sit down with people from all walks of life. Some people, wealthy owners of companies, you know, big or small, we were brothers in the lodge. And he he bragged to me one day, Kelvin, he said, um, over Christmas vacation, I was going back home, I think, to Alabama, wherever he lived, visit some folk, and he got caught speeding on the interstate, doing like 100 miles an hour. In America, you know, you get a ticket, you might get your car impounded and go to jail for that. Not only did he get off, he, I guess he did some secret handshake, but he said he then proceeded to speed again, got stopped a second time right down the road. And what do you know, two of these state troopers in a row were Masons and let him off. And then he told me one other interesting thing. He said, uh, he said I just bought myself a Mercedes Benz because I'm a Mason. I went over and a fellow Mason gave me a $4,000 discount. So he was kind of bragging about some of the perks that go along with it. Uh, there's then also a rumor in my family. Now, I told you I'm aware of at least one, maybe two uh, Mason connections, one on my dad's side and, of course, on my grandmother's side, my mom's side. There was rumor that um, my great-granddaddy's brother was a Mason. He was a bootlegger in South Georgia. He went to jail for bootlegging. And uh, he was a mason and apparently did some kind of signal to the guard and they let him go. This has been like back in the 20s or the 30s in America. Do these kind of things actually happen? Do um, you think these could be based in truth? That these are some of the perks? I mean, if you get caught speeding or you're in before a judge, if you can communicate to him that you're a mason, you might actually find that the judge is a, a brother in the lodge and would he be compelled to let you go? Well, I wouldn't be competent to discuss that, and I don't really think it's a good line to be going down because I think I'm much more concerned about the spiritual effects yes. that Freemasonry has had within the body of Christ and on families. And whilst I'm sure these things may happen and happen for all sorts of reasons, I would be much more concerned about the the deep, deep spiritual effects within our within the body of Christ um, now I, I, I'm deeply concerned that yes. the the church is to a large extent even though many many of the denominations in the churches have expressed concern about Freemasonry they have not really taken the situation seriously yes sir uh, for example, for example I know that the Presbyterian Church in Ireland back in 1992 decided that uh, Freemasonry was really incompatible with communion, communicant membership. Yes, sir. But nothing, nothing was done about it. And so to this day, uh, there are many Masons within the body of the Church, and um, you know they are not. It's not never been really dealt with as an issue a deep spiritual issue which is affecting our, our spiritual authority in Christ well I tell you it's not every day I get to speak to someone who had uh, actual involvement in it and got out and so in some of those questions I'm just trying to separate fact from fiction I'd hear the stories let me ask another um, off the wall question is there any connection between Freemasonry and the Boy Scouts. I've heard that there may be, and that may be, a recruitment center for later Masons. They take them out of the Scouts. Any truth to that? I, I doubt if that is, uh, again, I suppose, if, if, if someone is a Mason and is involved with Boy Scouts, it may provide an opportunity, but I, I don't really think that there's any deep connection I think it is probably the case that uh, Baden Powell himself was a Mason, and perhaps that's why that has been 
suggested, but I, I, I would hesitate to suggest that that is a link that is uh, frequently used. The reason I asked is I was a Boy Scout for a, about a year or two as a young kid, and of course they have the Scout's Oath. And you have to hold your hand up, and you do like three fingers, and they would have the, yep. they call it the lodge. Um, then there's the order of the arrow and higher levels. So I just was curious if you had any um, knowledge of a connection there. It seemed like some of the things may be connected. Um, we're live with Kelvin McCracken, if you're just joining us. So, Kelvin, um, I want to get to some more of the more important issues, and that is... Being involved in Freemasonry uh, brings a curse. Is that true? And how far down can these curses run for involvement uh, in Freemasonry in someone's family line? Well, certainly, I mean, if we go back to the commandments onto the third and fourth generation, and certainly we have seen, as I quoted that example, that was a great grandfathers who had, and I believe in cases we have seen that it was great grandfathers who were the the potential source. Yes, sir. But um, because of the potential also for sexual sin, adultery, and so forth, I mean, it, I, I would would not be surprised if seventy percent or more of the body, the people within the Protestant churches in the West, are in some way tainted by generational sin I'm going to go with by this generation. and uh, I'm going to go with I think at least three to four generations I know the word says God will visit yeah. the iniquities of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those that hate him clearly this would be um, something that I think could bring a curse to go down at least that far of course hey if the devil can get a descendant of a mason to become a member, he just can keep that clock reset. This thing could temp- potentially run down many generations, right? By others Undoubtedly. Yeah. getting in. Um, you said something earlier which um, it brought back a memory. <clears throat> I shared my own situation, and you prayed with me uh, regarding my great grandfather being a, yeah. a third degree mason, and what was weird is when I confirmed it and I looked at the dates of his uh, initiation it was just a few years before he dies he dies at age 52 then I saw this pattern God was showing me you've got a generational curse need to break granddad dies at 58 when I learned about this my dad was suffering from cancer he died a year later at 57 my brother and I were the next targets and that's when God showed me what we were dealing with and um of course, I told you there was a history of sexual sin. Um, I have an uncle who was also Mason. My father was not, nor was my grandfather. But I asked my uncle, I said, uh, Uncle, uh, are you still Mason? He says, no, I've, I've gotten out of that. I said, okay, good. But uh, he tells me that uh, when he was a young boy, his grandfather, which was the great-grandfather who got in Masonry for me, did some ritual on him and I said uh, well why did you get involved in it and, and my own dad didn't get involved or grandfather he said well of course your great, my daddy your granddad wanted no part of what his father was doing but he said your father um, was not selected and he used the language because he was um, had blemish a blemish on him and I said what do you mean and I, I found out when my dad was like 15 Kelvin uh, he had cancer God subsequently healed him. But I think what he was trying to tell me was that his grandfather, the one that was a master mason, tapped him instead of my dad because my dad was blemished. He had an illness uh, and apparently passed something on to my uncle. Uh, So is there any significance there about blemishes? Could you become a master? I mean, could you become a mason if you've got any kind of disability or infirmity? Just out of curiosity. Well, as I say, in the original, um, there is that phrase, without maim or defect. Right. Now, I believe that that has been modified within uh, 
lodges uh, within the orders in, in more recent times and maybe it's not applied in the way it may have been years ago but that is part of the wording of the original uh, rituals well then so the, at one point in time the kind of they wanted people that were pretty you know without st- stain or blemish right <laughs> uh, interesting folks we're getting into the mind of a man who has a lot to share and he's revealing things that um, I didn't know and uh, we're working up to uh, something very important that's how you can be set free uh, we're just kind of laying the groundwork in, in um, this interview with Kelvin to find out what's going on with masonry well Kelvin um, in talking with you you made a very important point that I've never heard anybody bring out and that is a person may have no direct descendant that was involved in Freemasonry and that's good if they don't parent, grandparent, whatsoever and I was thinking well then that person probably wouldn't have anything to worry about as far as a Freemasonry curse but the truth couldn't be further from I mean uh, the, the, the truth is something very different than that and that is that there could be a person listening right now who has no involvement in Freemasonry or their ancestors but their spouse does and through that soul tie, they're under the same curse as their spouse. Is that true? Yep. And furthermore, where there have been previous relations, um, either fornication or earlier marriages, and followed by divorce, yes, sir. Then the the sexual activity of those people uh, also implies that there can be further. Open, uh, doors have been opened to provide uh, a foothold for the enemy. So, so it, sexual it needs sin. The, the wording of the prayer actually is very specific in dealing with the whole area of sexual sin okay. and the impact of ancestors. And also, interestingly, because of a revelation a number of years ago, uh, the effect through the church, anyone who has or has had spiritual authority over us where it may have been a, a, a bishop involved in ordaining or baptizing or whatever that there also can be um, a spiritual foothold there as well oh very key point all, all of that is covered within the prayer ok folks there's good news tonight you can be free Kelvin uh, one more miscellaneous question I've heard about the thing called Eastern Star is this Freemasonry for women yep and it, I, I know that there are one or two lodges here in Ireland. Uh, I suspect it's probably much stronger in USA, but I don't know the details. Now, I've seen but lodges, is, typically, they'll be in a geographical location, maybe a city. They'll have a number assigned as a member of, let's say, a lodge in Ireland. Can you go anywhere in the world and be welcomed in uh, for a visit to another lodge, or are you only allowed to enter your specific lodge where you joined up? Oh, you have a, a membership certificate and you can go to a lodge. This is one of the, the benefits that are particularly for people who are working overseas or traveling overseas. They can go and find fellowship in any part of the world pretty well. Okay. Now, in your time involved in Freemasonry, was there any um, characteristic that you saw repeated over and over again where... Um, let's say people that have been involved in Freemasonry typically they're going to have this in common such as uh, divorce fornication, adultery any of those sexual sin characteristics or any other red flags that might be in common with people involved in Freemasonry I don't think anyone has ever done such a study Um, the one thing though that I would say I, I would affirm that there is a, a spiritual deadness over most who have been trapped by into Freemasonry and I used to be able to look down the church and see men who simply couldn't worship couldn't praise they were uncomfortable um, and one would have identified now it's not every case I mean I was in the choir another friend of mine was a very 
boisterous um, joy singing and so forth and praising quite quite openly, freely but I would say that the tendency was that most Masons really felt uncomfortable in the church setting in some way spiritually that, that uh, they uh, and certainly this whole area right across the church how many people do you know who find it difficult to pray in public true a large number Kelvin here's a million dollar question is Freemasonry witchcraft and can a Freemason um, go to heaven if they don't come out of the, the lodge before they die I believe Freemasonry is socially allied to witchcraft but in my own experience and this is what I, why I gave you so much of the story the Lord is a very gracious and loving father and I was acting in a state of ignorance when I joined Freemasonry talking back to Leviticus and this unwitting area of sin yes sir now he led me into the healing ministry and he used me in the healing ministry before I came out of Freemasonry and he blessed my wife with that beautiful experience on the 21st of January 1985 and I don't believe that my my salvation was actually uh, in jeopardy at that point now if someone had come to me and explained to me as David did um, you know that that I needed to repent or come out of Freemasonry and I had rejected that then I the, the jury's out on that one but I do believe that there is that there are many and I, I'm thinking of the Orange Order in, in Ireland Sure, I believe there are many brothers in Christ who are in it and yet they have unwittingly most of them taken the first three degrees in Freemasonry in the so called degree of the Royal Arch Purple Chapter um, I believe they are still brothers in Christ but if they have been told that they should be that they have been in idolatry and refuse to repent then I leave that question open well clearly if you're getting to a level where you know they're revealing the names like Baphomet and Ahura Mazda again uh, at what level will you begin to run into some of these uh, uh, clearly demon entities fourth degree well Jabulon appears in the fourth degree and that has Baal, Baal. but yeah. the the resurrection uh, the false resurrection occurs in the master mason degree ok which is third degree yeah ok so folks you don't have to be very far into it uh, you know to run into some of these guys uh, we're talking about these demon entities once again where would you actually uncover the name Ahura Mazda when would that be revealed at what level I presume at the 32nd degree it's the first I've been aware of it now what's the difference now, between there, are the very few, there are going to be very few 32nd degree masons well relatively ok um, but I think the point the point I'm making is that whether you are aware of them or not that in that first degree you have already signed up under his authority ok so at the first level you are already bowing down to every demon in the organization uh, yeah. Now, what's the difference between the thirty-second and thirty-third degree? Is the thirty-third like a general? There's very few generals well, in the he's army. The, he's the grand master of the grand lodge of whichever jurisdiction. So okay. there are not so many thirty-third. The, the prince of um, the Duke of Kent is currently and has been for some time the the grand master of the grand lodge of England. I was told that at a certain level they reveal to you who's at the top of the organization that it's Lucifer is that true well I haven't been there so I can't answer the question but I know that Lucifer is in one of the levels at or close to the top um, is described as 
the true source of light whereas Jesus is described as darkness now that's pretty appalling brother that's very appalling um, this same individual I was telling you about who was a mason he would be asked for some reason to always pray I guess he was thought to be a religious man he'd be praying at these uh, award ceremonies where we'd have a dinner and he never mentioned Jesus but he always mentioned Aaron and I think he said Melchizedek if I recall now um, will you use Jesus Christ um, in the lodge do they mention the name Jesus as a course no, as a regular course? no that's one of the reasons that I felt eventually felt I had got to, to come out because we're to A told we can't discuss religion at all okay. and B the prayers are not prayed you know, in, re- in reference to Jesus um, it is simply uh, actually a witchcraft phrase that is used at the end of the prayer uh, so moot it be wow yet you may have the bible did you ever see the um, satanic bible or the Quran in any of the lodges you were involved in no but they would only be used in jurisdictions that um, were relevant because you could actually be a member of any religion and join a lodge is that true yes Okay, that makes sense that they would allow that in. Um, Kelvin, one more question I want to ask, and we'll give it back to you. I was in a graveyard looking for my great-grandfather's grave. I never found it. I guess there were so many there. I missed it. But I saw a number of Masons with the um, uh, the compass on the grave, but I would see a lot of um, graves next to them. It was the wife who was Eastern Star, and it had a, a weird-looking sign. It looked like a pentagram. I'm, I'm not going to joke. Um, like bafflement. Um, are there any strange rituals that uh, people undergo that are buried who are Masons? Will their funerals typically be conducted by Masons and they do anything strange by the gravesite? Yes, if, if, they have the, if they get the opportunity, um, they will have a, a graveside ritual and they, um, oh, I can't remember the name of the particular... Uh, plant which is invoked in, and, and put into the grave but yes there are there are potentially uh, some rituals that I have never attended such a, a, a burial but I have heard of them um, so yes to that extent very possible we're live with Kelvin McCracken Kelvin um what can a person do out there to be free? Because uh, I assume that we probably all got some Mason in our bloodline, very potentially, if we mm-hmm. have had more than one sexual partner. You know, uh, and these days there's a lot of promiscuity going on. There's a ch- yep. good chance you're going to run in to someone who's got it in their bloodline. Yep. And you build a soul tie with them. Well. You got a curse that's in operation. I really believe that. Like in my own family. Um, I'm going to give it back to you. Well, as I say, in 1997, the Lord graciously downloaded this prayer to me, and it has been used ever since. It fits on one A4 page for most people. Um, maybe issues at times deeper issues in families that one would want to include within the prayer but it covers the whole range of potential uh, generational sin and right down to to this generation and the key passage well one of the paragraphs in it is a paragraph forgiving those who have unwittingly brought any curse down upon the family line And I do believe that really confession, repentance and forgiveness are all key elements of coming into freedom in Christ. So that prayer is available to people. Uh, I suggest that perhaps if people want to write into your program that we could set up um, some means of distributing that and perhaps having... uh, a time of of prayer at some point Uh, basically one I like people to to pray the prayer with understanding so spending a little time explaining what's in it 
and why it's there so that they're not just praying words having prayed the prayer and preferably if there's a man and a wife or a you know spy, uh, yes a man and a wife in most cases then um, that they would both pray the prayer at the same time since they are one flesh then I make a short declaration of their new freedom and I bind the spirits that are known to me that are maybe associated and then they take up their true authority in Christ having been set free and command the the various spirits to depart and leave them and break every curse that could potentially be there um, there's a, a, a two sheet page really a two pages of um, steps of dealing with everything from the head to the feet so to speak over the body and in the areas of uh, specific acts for example the, the false resurrection uh, the person is raised so called from the dead, the dead level to the living upright into the bondage of Freemasonry uh, and uh, there are rituals like that which need to be specifically broken I believe as well so it's a process that takes about say, an hour in total um, but it is seeking to be as thorough as possible in breaking off any of the footholds that the enemy may have through any level of Freemasonry that may have been invoked Kelvin, so people could take this two-page um, deliverance prayer that the Lord gave you. Could they actually do self-deliverance themselves if they read it out aloud and meant it as they prayed? Or do you need I to... don't recommend self-deliverance in such cases. It's, um, uh, I think it is key that, that those spirits are bound... I think this is why we don't see any manifestations these days that yes. the spirits are bound by someone who is in a position of authority and therefore it's the prayer the first step is the prayer which is about to say one page then the declaration of freedom and binding those spirits cutting them off from anything that has had a foothold and then they can take up their authority in Christ and could then pretty well preferably I would say in the presence of a, a mature Christian um, deal with the two pages in terms of breaking declaring their freedom from the various curses now, but normally I would minister to people even sometimes by Skype yes, um, and maybe feel led to intervene on occasions to uh, over certain issues okay but it is the first step would be to for people to if they are interested to, to get hold of the, the prayer um, it has to be modified slightly for each case where people have had multiple marriages and so forth in order to yes, ensure that you have closed all the doors ok folks we're live with Minister Kelvin McCracken now brother Kelvin um I know for a fact there will be people tuning in that say, hey, I am certainly aware that I've got Freemasonry in my bloodline. I want to be free. Um, do you make your ministry available if people would like to contact you and go through some one-on-one -on -one Skype deliverance? Is that currently available? Um, well, in a limited way that could be available, but it would be very difficult if I got, say, a a hundred responses to this today, that would be a bit scary. Okay, now that's part two. <laughs> Let's say we get a thousand people tuning in that say, hey, you know what? I probably got something. I don't even want to take a chance. I just want to go through that prayer. I think it would uh, it'd be very difficult for you to minister to them individually, 1,000. Would you consider doing a program where people could obtain a copy of your deliverance prayer and who would like to participate you proceed over a, a deliverance session over radio and you would lead them through it um, they would pray and then you could bind up the spirits would that scenario work for someone to be free how do we get I believe, I believe that's feasible it would be, we need to sort out the logistics of it but yes okay. I do believe that it could be done um, here's what I feel in my spirit 
it's more than just having a testimony that, yes, Freemasonry is something you don't want a part of. It, uh, it, it's involvement with the demons all the way up to Ahura Mazda and Lucifer himself. No question about that. And I appreciate these demons being exposed because I was not aware of some of these characters. However, I believe we have a opportunity here, Kelvin, to reach out around the world. A program could go viral. We could have 100,000 people tuning in. And imagine 100,000 people, even 1,000 or 100 is awesome, um, saying, hey, I want to come out of agreement with these spirits. I want to break this curse off my family line. Like you did, Omega Man. I prayed with Kelvin. Um, I want you to meditate on that and see how the Lord directs you. Because I would propose we do exactly that. And we do a worldwide deliverance from Masonic spirits. You can lead people through it. However you want to make available a copy of your deliverance prayer. And we take the shotgun approach and deliver a multitude over the air in Jesus' name. What do you think about that? I would love to be able to assist in any way anyone who wishes to come into freedom. Uh, we have, over the last, well, 20 odd years, we've probably prayed with a couple of thousand people, and we have never really had any complaints from anyone. We've had a lot of good responses of people feeling a new freedom, coming into a new understanding of God's Word. That was one of the things that really struck my wife after her experience. She just got began to get new revelations. Um, for example, got Jesus' words about oh, taking oaths and saying, let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything beyond that comes from the evil one. And uh, the other scriptures that came to mind with me in relation to the, uh, the uh, let there be light and so forth, and one beautiful example I could quote was years ago a man who had been in Freemasonry and he began to get more interested in his church and he started going along to the early morning prayer meeting but he was most frustrated because he could never get to the point of actually praying he felt as if he was being choked every time that he went to pray and he and his wife and the minister and a couple of elders came to our house and we prayed with him nothing spectacular happened but at the end of the evening we prayed around the room and he was able to pray and he went two days later to the early morning prayer meeting and he prayed for about half an hour they couldn't get him stopped he was so overjoyed that he had new freedom so I just longed to see people coming into a deeper experience of Jesus and his love and power and presence and I believe that this is part, a really powerful key for many people that they can come into that deeper relationship and into a new place of authority seated in the heavenly realms with Christ Kelvin, again I can testify in my own life that God spoke to me audibly in my dream and said you and your brother Damon have a generational curse you need to break and what are we going to do with that? Uh, we were raised in the church, but they didn't believe Christians need deliverance. I didn't know anybody who could help me. But thank God for some that have come along before us, like the late Derek Prince. And he wrote a book about breaking generational curses. No question about yep. it. Curses are real. And the good news is we can be free. So we started our deliverance with, you know, basically a basic renunciation prayer. Um, I was able to augment that just last week, folks, with um, a session with Brother Kelvin McCracken going into more detail because Kelvin's correct, Satan is a legal expert and he has the most detailed renunciation prayer I've ever seen on the subject of Freemasonry and so I praise God for my freedom but I think the the tables could be turned on the enemy Kelvin in such a way using internet radio uh, you're going to be heard by people around the world, different countries this needs to be exposed. Actually, my prayer has been for a long time, many years. I said, God, send us somebody that can help us blow the cover off Freemasonry. God answered that prayer. Uh, little did I know we would be meeting Kelvin McCracken in the last month through Brother David Measures. And I'm like this. It's time to give the devil a black eye, Kelvin. The best way we can do that is see people renounce this and 
loose these chains in Jesus' name off them and their descendants. Because I, I saw what was coming for me. It would have been premature death. And I thought, you know, it's not that difficult to break this. But if we don't take action, then it's not broken. And the enemy is going to claim one victim after the next. Killed my great-grandfather. Premature death. My grandfather died at 58. My dad died at 57. God gives me the dream. And that's about the time I uh, got really serious about deliverance ministry. 2005. And it was now up to me and my brother. Would we be the next casualties? Do nothing and then you know, our death would be premature? Or were we going to be the first in the line of three to four generations to take action and say, this curse stops now. We don't want any part of these sins. We will forgive our ancestors for being involved in it. Thank you for bringing that out. But we're going to break this stuff now in the name of Jesus and be free. In Jesus' name. I think that there is a multitude that will say, yes, Kelvin, they would like to be free. Uh, how would you like to proceed? I would encourage you, to, perhaps that you can encourage your, your listeners to contact you and indicate their interests uh, with email or whatever. I don't know what your process is. Okay. And that then we will, uh, presumably you can set up that we would spend another session when we could do a little bit of teaching about the nature of the prayer. Yes, sir. Then get people in their own situations to pray the prayer and we can perhaps um, we have to discuss whether we seek to facilitate them in the actual declaring the freedom the second stage or whether they can do that on their own or perhaps with the help of a Christian friend um, that's one area where we might not be able to so easily to do that over the air but um, perhaps we could at least be available subsequently for people to deal with questions that had arisen from that experience. We've done before, many times, uh, leading people through renunciation prayers of involvement in the occult, various sins. And then those that wanted to pray along with us could do that. And then the minister was also able to um, minister to them to whatever degree they needed to. Um, whether it be to bind the spirits, call the spirits out, what what have you. Uh, one way that I might suggest we could do it is um, you do whatever teaching you want to do to you sufficiently ready to lead people through the prayer and then you devise how we can make it available, whether it's you give me a PDF that we can put on the website, whatever that they can download, and we set a date. You come on, and uh, I'll read the prayer with you right over the air. I'll yeah. be like, um, I am the person tuning in, and what I do, they can do too right out there. They can repeat along with me, mm -hmm. and then you do what you need to do. Yeah. So everybody, myself included, we will go through that renunciation prayer that want to be free, and Kelvin could minister to you right where he's at in Ireland in Mass as an adjunct uh, to maybe people that want to schedule a direct appointment with you. What do you think about that? I want you to pray about that. We got the time, I'm certainly. I'm, I'm totally open to that. Yes, I'm totally okay. open to that. I, I call that Mass deliverance. Um. Clearly, how are you going to minister one on one to ten thousand people? You might be here till Jesus comes back, not even getting through one <laughs> percent. And sadly, Kelvin, that's the state of deliverance in the church right now. Deliverance should be in every church. However, I don't know too many that are involved in deliverance. Have you ever been in a church setting and you wanted to bring up the issue of Freemasonry and you were squashed? Um. <laughs> It's been a, a, an interesting um, discussion. I have tried to get into a number of Bible colleges, and uh, my uh, offers have not yet been accepted. And I don't see them forthcoming. That's the problem. Where does a person go to get deliverance from Freemasonry? Uh, brother, I don't know 
more than just a handful that even know anything about Freemasonry. That's why it's such an asset to have you here on this program tonight to help us get to the bottom of this. And God clearly delivered you, and not only for your own deliverance, but set you on a course. How many years have you been helping people get set free of Freemasonry? Since 1992, he sort of dumped us straight into it as soon as we came home from Corfu. And uh, it was a learning experience, a rapid learning experience over the first three or four years. And then that really revelation in 1997 that really opened up a whole new perspective. Um, Amazing. And I, I'm involved with an organization called Times of Refreshing Ministries that um, has been the main vehicle by which we have ministered to people over the past 20 odd years my brother you have carte blanche we'll do as many programs as is necessary so we got the time there's no problem on that Um, and so all we need to do is work around your schedule folks this is just the beginning I told brother Kelvin to prepare that we will probably do a series and that's the way I operate Um, one of the reasons God gave me this program Kelvin is because I wanted there to be a platform where we could get information out that could help people. And sadly, I would tune into other programs, and they might have a 30-minute show, and that was it. You might not hear the same speaker for another six months. And we never seemed to get down to the root issues that I wanted to see covered. Well, all that changed when I have my own platform. Now, 10 years this this month, we got all the time in the world. So that's not going to be any issue. How can a person tuning in tonight get a hold of you if they'd like to reach you right away? Do you have any means for them to reach you and contact you? I would suggest that they would contact Times of Refreshing Ministries. Um, The website is www.trmbelfast.com. T for Tommy, R for Robert, M for Martin, Belfast, all one word, dot org. Fantastic. We're going to put that in the show notes. And um, And they they can, uh, there's an email address there that they can contact. How did this particular time work today in your schedule? Is this an okay time to do a program? Yep. Okay. My schedule's wide open. I want you then to pray about uh, doing your next show with us. You can have the mic, do all the teaching you want, and um, let God lead you. Uh, Pray about doing what we have discussed, and that is you can lead people anywhere in the world that would like to pray this prayer through a freedom prayer. To go through the two page, renounce this and get set free. Because, brother, if you don't do it, I don't know how people are going to get free. There's not too many of you out there who know what they're talking about. I don't know too many people with knowledge on Freemasonry. And now it's apparent to me that it's prolific out there, the level of contamination. It could be in anybody's um, family line or their spouse's family line or a girlfriend's family line. I mean, people are one flesh until they break those soul ties, right? Yeah. I think the assumption is probably... Most tuning in have it in their soul tie. A high <laughs> oh. portion, certainly. By the way, what do you do if uh, you've had sex outside of marriage? I've uh, been married multiple times. Can you be set free of those ungodly soul ties? Yes. Confession, repentance, and forgiveness of where there's been perhaps sexual assault. Um, are all pathways to freedom. So not only can you break curses, but we can break ungodly soul ties. Amen? Yeah. Absolutely, I agree. Well, we can, but the Lord can. Absolutely. Absolutely. Apart from Jesus, we can't do anything. I want to be clear on that, too. But, you know, that's what Jesus Christ came to do, set the captives free. You know. Amen. The first sign that Jesus said among those that would follow those that believe, He said, in my name they shall cast out devils. Yet I don't see much going on in the church. I believe the enemy has done a great job keeping the 
ministry of deliverance from the church deceive many into thinking uh, you don't have any demons once you come to Christ mm. I have to say it's only when you come to Christ do you have the ability to get free of those demons and hold that ground <laughs> Amen. it's a children's bread and it's not automatic at salvation if everything was done at the cross then why are there still people that are sick we should have all been well, instantly sanct- healed. Sanctification is an ongoing life's work, really. Amen. And as we get more revelation, we come into, hopefully, a, a deeper place of true fellowship. Um, Kelvin, so, I have to, to say that I've learned it must be appropriated. Healing's available yeah. to cross. Salvation's available. But simply because Jesus died, that doesn't mean everybody's automatically saved. There's certain things we've got to do. Confess them as the Lord. Believe in the heart that God raised him from the dead. And you, then you can be saved. Repent of your sin. Just like deliverance is available at the cross, but it must be appropriated. It's not automatic. If so, then I shouldn't have had to break a curse because I was saved and in the church since age four. Made a public confession at 18, yet I was battling depression, mood swings. And I said, God... What's wrong? I have a chemical imbalance? Maybe I need psychotropic drugs. I was really considering that. And I cried out to the Lord, and He heard my cry, and He said, You and your brother Damon have a generational curse you need to break. And then it became apparent. I was dealing with something as a Christian, which could continue to hinder me, could result in my premature death, or could make matters worse if I didn't deal with it. Because it was there, and it was not removed at salvation. It wasn't difficult to deal with, but unless I took action, that thing was in operation. It was called a generational curse, Kelvin. Amen. The good news is you can be set free in Jesus' name tonight. You don't have to keep yep. these curses. Kelvin, um, the mic we is yours. Any... We can't repent on behalf of an of our ancestor. We can only repent on, be, on our own sin, but we can forgive those who have gone before and have unwittingly brought curses down upon us okay, and in that important. forgiveness then we come into true freedom so we forgive our parent or ancestor who did things that have brought a curse on us um, also it's important that we renounce it saying you know yeah. we don't want any part of these sins yep yeah. okay coming out of agreement with it right um we forgive our parent. We for, I forgive my great grandfather, who did it. Yep. I don't know why he did it. I mean, I don't know. I would like to know the answer to that, but he did, and it unleashed a curse, and I felt the effects of it almost fifty years later. Kelvin, anything else you'd like to add for episode one? <laughs> well. When the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. But we have to come to him and seek that freedom. And it's available, freely available to all. Could you pray for us tonight any any way the Lord leads you before we close out tonight? And anything else you'd like to add, the mic's yours. I'd just like to use some of the words from Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all its people belong to him. For he laid the earth's foundation on the sea and built it on the ocean depths. Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only those whose hands are and hearts are pure, who do not worship idols and never tell lies. They will receive the Lord's blessing and have a right relationship with God their Saviour. Such people may seek you and worship you in your presence, O God of Jacob. And Lord, we thank you that you seek to open the eyes of the blind and the ears of the deaf, that you desire that we would come into that deeper place of fellowship and relationship with you through the power of your Holy Spirit indwelling us. You describe us as saints, you describe us as a temple of the Holy Spirit. But Lord, we need to come into true position of agreement with you and freedom and sanctification where the enemy still has footholds so we thank you Lord that you have revealed so much 
of the the workings of Satan through organizations like Freemasonry. And I pray for all those who are already caught up and bound in Freemasonry and who will, if any of you have been hearing this, have probably been possibly even angered because of the deep um, relationship that they have with things they don't understand. So Lord, I pray that you will open their eyes and their hearts and give them that freedom that you bought for them at Calvary. That they will come out of that pit that Satan has dug for them and created around them and begin to understand that they have been deceived they are victims of a cruel deceit so I declare that Freemasonry is indeed a false religion a demonic power at work seeking to steal and kill and destroy but that Jesus has come that we will have life to the full so I bless all those who are listening today with that new abundant life that Jesus has prepared for us in his precious name Amen I say Amen folks it's been my distinct honor to have Kelvin McCracken on I want to thank Pastor David Measures for making Mm. this possible thank the Lord Jesus of course Uh, Kelvin I don't think we need to wait too long to continue this series and culminate in freedom Um, I want you to look at your calendar I've got available any Thursday you want, 18th, 25th, 2nd. You can do as many shows as you want. I mean, the mic's yours. I'll work around your schedule. But would you please check your schedule, and let's get a uh, part two going where you can come back and do some teaching in preparation for uh, some deliverance to break forth? I, I have no problem with the 18th. Um, I wonder if it would be good if, if you have people writing in with questions if we would sure. do a, 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 perhaps a, a session on the 18th dealing with those and with any other issues that have been raised and then schedule the deliverance for perhaps a week later that would be great uh, would you like to tentatively book uh, 18th and the 25th And if anything comes up, we'll work around your schedule. But would you like to have those dates? Let's go for it. Let's do it. Same time? Yeah. That'd be fantastic. Folks, uh, it's been an honor to have Kelvin McCracken. Kelvin, one more time, give out that website for the ministry, please. Uh, TRM, T for Tommy, R for Robert, M for Martin, B-E-L-F-A-S-T, all one word, dot org org fantastic folks did you enjoy tonight I want you to share this with a friend it's time to get set free of Freemasonry and the curses that come along with it be free in Jesus name um, Kelvin, I would just a- say that the the website has information about Freemasonry but it's not up to date and the prayer is not up to date so um it would be much better to get that done through your website okay. to, to transfer to people. We'll work on that. I'll work with you on that. We can get a PDF that they could download. Yeah. And uh, are you also working on a book or a booklet, as I understand, for some future date? Uh, it's A booklet's perhaps too big a title for it. It's only about seven pages at the moment, but um, there's a lot of the, the sort of stuff that I've covered today and a little bit more in it Um, awesome, praise the Lord folks, Kelvin McCracken today tune in again next week for part two